Welcome to Rune Soup, a podcast about magic, culture, and the paranormal. Coming to you from my name is Gordon, and I shall be your host. Enjoy. Today on Rune Soup, we welcome musician, scholar, and astrologer Dr. Angela Voss. Dr. Voss is Program Director for the Myth, Cosmology, and the Sacred MA at Canterbury Christchurch Cathedral University, and is the author of the Western Esoteric Masters series book on Marsilio Ficino. Dr. Angela Voss, thank you very much for your time. It's a great pleasure to be here. Wonderful. Now we have a traditional first question around here. Angela, were you a weird kid? <laughs> no, I was an extremely conventional kid from an extremely conventional family. Um, although my parents did have one, what I would call weird friend, who I used to commandeer uh, in my teenage years and um, talk about all sorts of extraordinary things. But I think uh, I think my parents thought I was a bit uh, odd in what I was interested in. But no, really, really conventional when I was young. Yeah. So those interests that were a, a bit left afield field were they typically academic stuff? Were they were, were, did the uh, did the Renaissance find you early? The Renaissance found me when I was about 15 and um, I was playing lots of music and I happened to watch a television series called The Six Wives of Henry VIII, which had original Tudor music. And it just it did something for me. And I just realised that this period of music was what I wanted to devote myself to. So from about the age of 15, I became completely immersed in Renaissance art and music. And my friends were at discos and I used to lie on the sofa listening to Monteverdi for hours on end for getting high on, on that kind of music. So that was what introduced me to the period, was through the arts. It, uh, you say getting high on that kind of music. We will, of course, uh, talk about a one Mr. Ficino a little bit later. But uh, according to according to the best theories of the time, you can actually get high on it. It, 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 oh, does, it does have an effect on you. It does. It can induce the divine frenzy, as, as Platonists call it. But, of course, at the time, I didn't... Uh, I wasn't thinking of it in that way. Um, I just knew that it took me somewhere that nothing else did and um, connected me with something that was very, very powerful. And so that's what led me to want to pursue a career as a musician to begin with and to immerse myself in Renaissance and Baroque music. So were these the things that your parents thought maybe were a little bit odd? Did you come from a musical family? No, although my mother um, did play piano a bit, but... Um, no, I mean, my mother was a nurse. My father was a, an electrical engineer, but he later became an artist when he was uh, retired. But um, it was a very, very unspiritual kind of upbringing. My parents weren't at all interested in any kind of religious perspective on anything, um, although my mother was very artistic and enjoyed poetry and did her own um, artwork as well. But it was only really when I was at university that... Um, I had what I would call my sort of major awakening um, into a different way of thinking about the world, which was actually through reading Plato, funnily enough. Well, well, that's what he's for, and that's what university's for, Absolutely. I suppose. <laughs> well, I mean, I think I was probably the only one in a group of about 100 students who was, uh, who was deeply affected by Plato's myth of the cave. Well, is that uh, from about 15, you said, when the, the Renaissance first hit your ears? Uh, yeah. Did you kind of know? Yeah. The, did you know it was going to take you in the academic direction to start with, or was it actually was it the musical and then it, academic directions? Yeah, it was the music at first that really led me. Um, so I played. I was already playing the violin and piano, and I learned to play the lute, and I learned to play the viol, and then subsequently I learned to play the rock violin. And uh, I studied music at university with um, modern languages and classical studies as well. And then I just knew I wanted to immerse myself in the music. So I did a postgraduate year um, at the Guildhall School of Music studying early music. And then for most of my 20s, I just played music. I had various jobs, including working for Anthony Rooley, who was then the the um, director of the early music group, the consort of music. Um, and I just played as much music as possible. But it was it was in my 20s that I was introduced to Vigino and began to develop a kind of interest in more of the sort of intellectual side of the period, I suppose. And I began to connect the music to the to the ideas and the philosophy. 
Um, so it sort of dawned on me throughout my 20s that I wanted to study further and not just play the music. Music first, spheres second. Absolutely. And that, that is exactly, of course, how, how Plato would, would want it, because um, the idea that you immerse yourself, first of all, in a kind of imaginative, intellectual, kind of intuitive connection with something, and then, you know, the, the rational mind follows afterwards. Yeah. Well, you really, you say immerse, you're really not messing around if you if you learn the lute and the Baroque violin. <laughs> That, uh, that's impressive. And funnily enough, when you say you played uh, through your 20s, my, my next question was going to be, is there much call for lute playing in, uh, in modern Britain? But then I think, well, there, aren't there. there mustn't be that many people who play the, the lute. So actually, probably yes. Um, well, actually, I gave up the lute pretty quickly. I gave up the lute um, probably when I was about 19 or 20, because actually I found it too difficult. And there were some excellent lute players around. And, um, and I felt that stringed instrument, bowed stringed instruments were really more, um, more my, my thing. So I didn't really carry on with the lute and I played the viol and the brock violin. But um, yes, there are quite a few um, excellent lute players and within the sphere of early music, you know, it's, it's, it's quite, um, it is quite popular, but it is very, a very difficult instrument to play well. So you're, um, I'm just trying to get the sequence right. So you had uh, your first exposure to it was through uh, music and Tudor music and so on. And then you get Plato, which is good. Yes. And then, yes. You, f uh, yeah. and then you find oh, Ficino. Sorry. So was there a sense when, yeah. was there a sense when you first found Ficino that you, in, a, in an odd way, you went on, on quite a similar journey because he, you know, one of the defining things of his life was the discovery of Plato. Absolutely. Yes. Well, I mean, well, I think what he recognised in Plato was probably the same as what I did. Um, the power of Plato's myths is just extraordinary. And I think when a lot of philosophers tend to focus on the rational side of Socrates' dialogues, um, the, the myth, the mythic side tends to be a bit marginalised. But in fact, for Plato, you know, the myths were the highest form of expressing something that couldn't be expressed in any other way. So when, when I was studying um, classical literature and translation at university and we did a session on the Republic and the myth of the cave, it was somehow the power of that very sort of simple story of, of people being chained you know, in a cave, looking at the back wall, just looking at images flashing past that are reflections of other things and they can't turn around, and then one of them does turn around and walk out of the cave and sees that everything in the cave was a, was a kind of illusion or reflection. That just had such a powerful effect on me, and I kind of realised that I had been living in a bit of a cave and that there was this whole other depth of understanding everything that was available. So the, that particular myth, yes, had the effect on me that I think Plato wanted it to have on people, in other words, to wake them up to something. It's uh, there haven't been too many people. With let me rephrase that. It's my observation that that you can tell people throughout history that have kind of really got it. So, um, all the philosophy being a footnote to Plato, which is you know the famous Wittgenstein thing. It was Wittgenstein, wasn't it? Who said? Uh, I, I don't know. So yeah, somebody said that. I think it was Wittgenstein. Uh, but it, yeah. so him and people like Jung, uh, there are a few yeah. people, and it's it's that it's the realization that that the um that 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 cognitive mode, that mythic cognitive mode, um, yeah. may, maybe even Tolkien, because he said myths describe things that never happen but always are. Um, you you kind of see it, and I think uh, I think Ficino was was probably one of them. It, you can kind of tell that it would have been you know, just the light switching on in his head. Yes, well, that's the power of mythopoeic thought and writing, I think, is that it's, it's this power of symbol and metaphor to open something up beyond the literal, and you either go with it or you don't. And uh, the problem with our world is that we've been trained right from the beginning not to understand or recognise or you know, engage with the power of symbolism to open up a whole level of knowledge. So, you know, in our post-enlightenment worlds, everything is either literal or it's fantasy. So we've lost that bridge between um, 
between the word or the image and and the fact that it can point to some sort of I don't know higher initiatory form of knowing that was sort of abandoned in in the as the enlightenment progressed so that I think is what these great thinkers and writers are trying to restore they're trying to restore the fact that metaphor and symbol can lead a kind of continuous um lead us on a kind of continuous journey from nature the world the cosmos through to some this other mysterious whatever we want to call it gnostic kind of unitive form of of knowing but it's very difficult to to introduce that to to people if they're if they're stuck in a very literal perspective why do you think we keep losing it we've lost it twice so far at least um we lost it with the fall of the classical world and we lost it with the enlightenment as you said why do we keep losing it is it because it why oh yeah. gosh <laughs> um i'm uh, i'm absolutely fascinated by i don't know if you know the book by um ian mcgilchrist called the master and his emissary of course um yeah so that is um i think is absolutely masterful study of you know the problematic between these two modes of knowing that human beings have um and how throughout the last 2000 years or so you know these two modes have interweaved um, and one's become dominant and the other one it just seems to be part of the human condition and the human journey that somehow we we're needing to grapple with how to get these ways of knowing into a, into the right balance and it it seems that something about i mean i just don't know but being incarnated in this world seems to be about having to having to deal with you know the, the sort of um limitations of this sort of human vision and how it can be transformed in some way I, I don't know if I can say more than that about it really I had uh, I've had Gary Luckman on a couple of times and, and his most recent book was uh, well the last two that we spoke about um, were the quest for Hermes Trismegistus and then his biography of Colin Wilson and the sort of through line there is very much there's a, a lot of alphabet in the goddess but also very much Ian McGilchrist uh, master and his emissary and uh, yeah there's a there's a kind of is in 2017 looking backwards there's something because I'm going to ask you whether you think this is correct, but I think where uh, I think a more platonic mode is emerging over the last few years. I think we're heading back into a phase like that, having spent, say, from like the late seventies to probably the financial crash, and that may have been part of it in in a much more materialist uh, mode of thinking, uh, but. He, there's something odd about the fact, particularly when you think of, say, um, kind of tracking it from Descartes to now, it's almost as if this diversion into um, thinking that none of this stuff is real was necessary. To, it's almost like taking a different road to pick up a few things like molecular biology and so on uh, to come back and, and, and have that integrative mode, that kind of we need to go left yeah. and then we need to go right. And there's the synthesis yeah. kind of component to it. Yes. Well, I think, um, I mean, obviously, the whatever happened in the Enlightenment was absolutely kind of necessary to burst through, you know, an earlier form of, of a kind of, um, you know, a certain blinkeredness in terms of religious thinking and um, dogmatic um, ideologies, etc. So something happened to really allow, you know, a new sort of self-consciousness to come through. Um, but yes, as you say, a challenge is now to restore the balance back again. Um, and I think that's what the all the new age movements are about. They're, they're striving to, you know, try and find some way to counteract this immense dominance of, of rationality. I mean, I don't say the rational mind because that's that's something I think a bit more uh, profound. But this sort of shallow rationality that can't see beyond beyond its nose. I think that that's definitely what the new age is trying to do. Um, and the question is how to how to get the kind of um, a channel through to mainstream, you know, how 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 can we begin to reinstate, you know, this deep power of knowing into anything, you know, mainstream, education, politics, you know, everything, um, because there's still such a strong resistance. I think, uh, Angela, you're correct to specify the difference between rationality and the rational mind, because the rational mind is a component of the Neoplatonic thought. Um, yeah. Uh, that it's it's a good thing it's it, it's it's a it's a 
way of apprehension rather than yeah i i tend to use um materialism or or something because it's that's the sort of 19th century metaphysics that people have mistaken for science uh but yeah i will we'll actually get on actually let's do that now i mean why why do you separate out rational mind from rationality what 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 is the difference there from a platonic or neoplatonic perspective yeah, well, exactly as you said, I think uh, the rational mind from a platonic perspective, or perhaps more broadly, you know, esoteric perspective, is actually the part of us that is in service to the higher Gnostic part of ourselves. So, as McGilchrist says, you know, the rational mind should be the emissary, should be the, the servant of what, what is the master, which is this deep, deep, intuitive sense we have of being connected with something bigger than ourselves, however we want to put that. Um, so the rational mind should then be in service to this, and it should be the tool, it should be the way in which we're able to interpret, discuss, analyse, critique, all those very powerful qualities that, as McGilchrist would say, you know, our left, left hemisphere um, is very good at, uh, um, should be in service to this deeper kind of knowing. But what's happened is it's become divided from, it's become split off from this higher form of knowing. And what's one of my... Um, former colleagues Joseph Milne has called the, the ontological inversion has happened. In other words, what should be seen as this a deeper form of knowing, knowing has become relegated to, you know, just the mere imaginary or the fantastic or the illusory or the hallucinatory. And that's what happens when, when the left hemisphere becomes enclosed in, in its hall of mirrors, as, as McGilchrist would say. Yeah, absolutely. Do you think uh, because my my discovery of these sorts of ways of thinking initially triggered almost a feeling of anger. Like, why did why was this kept from me? <laughs> why, why did I why did I have to go and find this? Uh, and do you wonder if do you wonder if Ficino and and the kind of early Renaissance people thought that? Because this what we're talking about that. Uh, and what I think is happening, hopefully, culturally now, is is that early Renaissance phase of the rediscovery of these things, which belong to us and and were either lost or taken away. Um, one of my first emotions is anger. <laughs> well, yeah, I think it is a very emotional thing, um, particularly when you see people acting, you know, or making decisions or affecting other people's lives from a perspective that is you can see is is very limited. I think I think for someone like Ficino, it was um, maybe not so much anger, really, as immense excitement. You know that, and also for his patron Cosimo de' Medici and his colleagues in in his Platonic circle, you know, it was immense excitement that these texts were rediscovered, which had the potential to w wake people up and and to reinvigorate what he saw as rather rather a dry and dusty kind of Catholic dogma, Christian dogma, um, and. So that what he devoted his life to. Yeah, he um, here's a here's a weird metaphor for you. I was talking about this, uh, talking about the show with some friends uh, yesterday. Uh, it's almost like, and in, so Plato uh, in particular, Plato and the Hermetic texts. It's almost like a metaphoric Roswell crash, because it, like if you if you follow that, yeah. they suddenly have these things. This way, like the world got bigger overnight uh and they learn things about the world that they literally didn't know in a, in a day night sense yesterday and it it changes your entire cosmology so whether or not like we use roswell as a metaphor here i don't know if it happened but everyone knows what i mean uh yeah. it's almost like a roswell crash um yes although of course uh, communication being very very different then from where, what it is now um I suppose it did tend to ha happen in rather sort of small localized circles. Um, so yeah, you get various various sort of courts in the, in the Italian Renaissance, and then uh, then in the English Renaissance, of course, and various other centres developing these. But how far it actually spread beyond the intellectual world, of course, is is not not nowhere near as much as it could do now. So yes, it was a, it was a kind of amazing thing, but it is not as if these platonic philosophy was new i mean it, it you know people knew about it there were texts available um it did come up through through the arab world uh it was more like a sort of an intensification of something i think that 
Fortuno took and, and ran with, you know. So it was like a recognition that, um, and and as these things happen, as these sort of synchronicities happen, it, it sort of it, it corresponded with a whole um, lot of texts being being brought to Europe. Uh, and so there was, who can say, you know, why the time was right? It just seemed to be a time when when the Western world, anyway, was was ripe for some kind of awakening in this way. And Fortuno just says, you know, that he recognised himself as being sent by divine providence to to do this work you know, for the sake of mankind. Well, that's actually a good uh, a good point to sort of ask um, Angela, who was Marsilio Fortuno, and was he a weird kid? <laughs> I don't know what he was like <laughs> as a child, although. The earliest reference we have is, um, we're not sure if it's absolutely true, but the earliest reference we have is, is one of his biographers says that when he was 10 years old, he was introduced to the great Cosimo de' Medici uh, because his father was a Cosimo's physician. And Cosimo de' Medici recognised that this was going to be the person who was going to translate Plato for him, even when he was 10. So there must have been something pretty special about him when he was 10. Um but he's yes, he started uh, working up when he was a bit older. Obviously, he was entrusted with the Corpus Hermeticum, which was uh, recently brought to Florence, and um, Plato, the, the text of Plato, the new text of Plato that were being discovered by Cosimo. Um, and he was set to work. He was given a villa. He was given patronage, and he was told to to translate these. And this, so it was really a kind of joint a collaboration between between Ficino and Cosimo at that point. Do you know, is, uh, I've been to Florence a couple of times and I've been to the Palazzo de' Medici and what have you and into the libraries and there's really, like they had a lot of books, but there's sort of a couple of rooms there. Was it actually translated in the Palazzo or was it in, as far as you're aware, I mean, it's a weird question. It's just one of my sort of oh. post-travel ones. Was it in, uh, was it in uh, Marsilio's residence or was it in the Palazzo? Well, uh, we know that Cosimo um, gave Ficino a villa in Careggi, which is just outside Florence, um, which is now a hospital, um, I think, in which to work. Um, so that was there. And there was also, I suppose, Ficino's own house, which was um, situated in the most amazing location in the hills just outside Florence. And I went there um, some time ago. Um, the house doesn't exist. The original house doesn't exist, but there's one right on the spot where where Ficino's house was, and the view over Florence is just completely stunning. So, I would imagine that he that he worked in both places. Yeah, yeah, because I just mm. I wasn't sure how the uh, texts the the Greek texts were treated if there was one of them. Like obviously, it's a very valuable object that had you know come from uh, come from the fall of Byzantium, but. I just wasn't sure. Like, do, is this something you take around with you, like I do when I'm working <laughs> when I'm working on research, or is it something that you kind of like lock down? Because when I was in the uh, Medici Library, I'm like, am I in the room where the where the Hermetica was translated out of Greek? Is, is and that's why I thought I'd ask. It turns out I wasn't. <laughs> well, it's a very interesting question. I have to say, I don't really know. I mean, I don't know if anyone knows you know, exactly where where the work took place. But yeah, I mean, I'm sure these these places must have felt very very venerable with, with, with the ancient texts coming in to be, because it wasn't, obviously, it was what the texts were saying that was just, you know, so important. Well, that's what I was thinking. Like, if I was Cosimo, I've paid for this. It, it stays in my yeah. house, right? <laughs> yes. And, and apparently, um, you know, Cosimo asked for the Corpus Hermeticum to be read to him on his deathbed. Um, he felt it was that, that important, that it would contribute to the saving of his soul even well that's sort of what, what i meant by the roswell crash episode because it was only later that people uh worked out who sla who homies trismegistus was slash wasn't and that he wasn't yeah. it wasn't wisdom from before the flood and it wasn't he wasn't a contemporary of moses uh and so on so it, at the time like this was this was mainlining the kind of the code that runs reality it was uh it was like having an over unity energy machine it's it was that important that different uh, and it, it well, turns yeah. out it's not but you know <laughs> well um i suppose it depends how you you look at it i mean they absolutely believed that this was wisdom going right back to you know, an egyptian who was contemporary with moses so they felt they really understood this to be 
a kind of tradition running in parallel with Christianity and foretelling Christianity and empowering Christianity. That's that's the thing we must never forget that as a Christian culture, um, the, the the Christian message was was the ultimate, and the Hermetic tradition was seen as as completely empowering this tradition by emphasising the immortality of the soul, emphasising individual visionary initiatory experience, all these kind of more deeply experiential aspects Ficino felt could really help transform Christianity for people. So that was what was behind it. Um, and the fact that it, it went right back to Egypt and the fact that Plato was understood as studying in Egypt and Egypt, you know, was this the golden age of its primordial wisdom. And of course, even though we now know what was discovered in the 17th century that Hermes Trismegistus himself was probably a kind of mythical figure um, devised in an early century CE. Nevertheless, you know, it's now been shown by scholarship that the Egyptian elements of the Corpus Hermeticum are very, very profound and, and that it does actually connect back to, to Egyptian wisdom, you know, written in Alexandria, after all, and um, with, with a mixture of Greek and, and, and Egyptian elements coming through. So, yeah, there are very strong Egyptian elements in it, even though Hermes himself... Um, I'm sure you know, never actually existed as a as a historical person. Oh, absolutely. I uh, it's I had this conversation with Aaron, which we were talking about before the show. But I think it, from a DNA perspective, it's um, it's sixty percent Egyptian and forty percent all the rest. So forty yeah. percent other Eastern Mediterranean influences. Uh, you yeah. you see it, and it's been interesting to to watch these things kind of come through out of sequence because we didn't we couldn't think that prior to the um prior to the Rosetta Stone and, and and the sort of cracking of the hieroglyphic code, but then all of a sudden the the general map of um ascending and matching stars and so on is right there at the beginning of the old kingdom with pyramid text and so on. So it really was a kind of gathering up of the silverware at the end of um Alexandria. Uh, and and trying to kind of keep it, it's it, and you feel that if you kind of read it or use it as a meditative uh, leaping off point, you kind of, it has the mouth feel of something authentic and old. So I can I can absolutely see why Cosimo had it read to him on his deathbed. Yeah, and I think I think the power of it is this: the fact that it is so centered on um, the, the real the, the divinization process, really. You know, the realization that one's soul is immortal through ritual, through um, being in states of altered consciousness and entering into some other reality. You know, it's, it's, it's very, very heady and it's, it's very, um, yeah, it's a really sort of, um, it, it's not a theoretical text, you know, it's an experiential text that would have been used in ritual practice to actually take people to that place. And that's what I think was recognised. And so for, for Juno particularly, he was able to see the relationship between this and the Platonic text and the Neoplatonic text, that somehow there was something here that was of crucial importance to this, what we might now call kind of consciousness raising, you know, of, of, of people realising that there is something immortal about themselves and that in order to cultivate that, there are certain practices that, that need to be done. There's a certain way of understanding themselves and life and the universe. And, and it's very much to do with entering into this mythical symbolic way of seeing which you know is why again for someone like Virgino, magic and astrology were all part of the the platonic quest he was uh he, he kind of he's playing with fire a little bit with that stuff though i mean he was accused of heresy once but there uh it's florence is more or less the only place you can do it due to the sort of political layout well you could have used other northern italian cities but the uh the, uh, the the political tensions between different Italian city states at the time means that you can play a little bit faster and looser with uh, Catholic doctrine. Kind of the further away from the further away from the papal states yeah. you get, and because uh, he did, he, he was accused of heresy yeah. and this stuff. Yeah. Uh, in particular, it's my understanding anyway. In particular, it's there in black and white in um, the Hermetic text in Plato that the soul pre uh, predates or exists prior to incarnation, and it and it as it 
sort of descends or falls into the physical it, it kind of bounces like you're um like you're playing a pinball machine through the different spheres and you get the different things and then you're a human and that is a netty no-no for the church the uh the, the idea that you could predate your incarnation is not correct well yes and and any anyway, the more you think about it it just you realize what an extraordinary thing for Gino did to try and marry these two traditions or to try and to try and find ways of talking about the Hermetic and Platonic worldview, which didn't, you know, which didn't sort of contradict um, the teachings of the church. So he was always so careful in the way he put things. I mean, as you say, he was um, condemned for heresy at one point, but um, that was much later. Ma- he he managed to get his whole later. career yeah. through without with he, with he one did. little brush with heresy. <laughs> That's right. Um, and I think it was because he was incredibly wise. I think it's because he he was able to situate himself sort of intellectually beyond the, the conflict. You know, he was able to see how a, a much more sense of a universal religious sense in, in which Christianity and Platonism and these traditions all played their part in revealing something. So he was able to locate himself in a place through which he could look back and kind of, you know, kind of suss out the right way of saying things so that you wouldn't offend one party or another. So he's always very careful to say, well, Plato says such and such and such, and Iamblichus says this, and Plotinus says this. And of course, you know, we never contradict the doctrines of the church. And just very, very savvy, I think, is how he managed to to do that. Do you think he was lying? Do you think he was uh, he was more... Uh, pagan and platonic then and I think you're right I think he he played he navigated the the kind of game of heresy better than most um, who kind of dared to play but do you think he was lying do you think he was actually a uh, a bit more heretical than his text would suggest I think he was absolutely fascinated and drawn in particularly after he discovered the Neoplatonists, I mean, after he was particularly Amplicus, I think, I mean, one of my favourite texts is his three books on life, um, and the, they, they Vita Celitus Comparanda, you know, the third part, which is about how to fit your life to the heavens, very astrological and very magical. And I think he was absolutely fascinated by theurgy, by what Amplicus was doing with theurgic ritual. And I'm sure he would have recognised that this was so almost identical to the kind of rituals that that the the church was using. Um, So I don't think he was lying. I think that he genuinely could see that both traditions were leading in the same direction, even though they may have slightly different paths or different ways of leading in that direction. And he was dealing with a world that couldn't see that. So... That was that was the struggle of how to actually articulate the benefits, you know, of both paths, perhaps without without getting himself into trouble by those who couldn't see that. So I think he was he didn't address head on, you know, dilemmas. He didn't address contradictions head on and try to argue them out. That wasn't his style. He will always move into a kind of metaphoric style of saying this is like this or let's remember the myth of something or other or let's speak in poetry and then we can we can imagine such and such a thing so he's trying to lead people away from a kind of dogmatic engagement in conflict and argument because again as a true Platonist he would realize that that's just that's just the rational mind playing its games you know that's we need to move somewhere deeper and and try and understand where the religious impulse, you know, what it, what that is for human beings, and, and so I think that he was beyond his time in a way, and he was struggling with the, the limitations of people who who couldn't see this in the same way. He was definitely that's a good way of describing it. He was definitely beyond his time. You mentioned yeah. I think um, Iamblichus does that to everyone, but I think. Uh, you mentioned the astrology part of it, and I think that's where I'm talking about where I wonder if he's lying or not, because he, with his astrology in particular, and not in a negative way, like, uh, I mean, I wonder if he, I wonder if his private astrological natural magic wasn't, um, uh, wasn't a bit further away from kind of what he might tell the priest, you know, um, because he he did kind of have a, have his cake and eat it too relationship with astrology, didn't he? Yes, although it is an extraordinary time. I mean, he was writing. He was writing to the Pope about his horoscope. He was, you know, he had conversations with all sorts of politicians, statesmen, churchmen, 
um, about astrology. And he was all the time trying to, I think it, one of his, you know, one of his missions was to um, transform people's understanding of what astrology was about too. So he was living in a world where the main understanding of astrology was that it was predictive. It was about foretelling some kind of fate or f uh, fixed future. Um, and he was the first, really the first, what we might call humanistic or even psychological type of astrologer who understood, no, that this, this is not about a fixed fate. This is about reading the signs, you know, reading the divine signs, um, which point you towards you being in, in control of your own destiny. So that's what he was trying to work with, with astrological symbolism. And it, 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 I mean, I've been an astrologer myself for like 35 years now. And so I'm kind of deeply immersed in in that world and that symbolic language. And it's the fact is that when astrologers get together to chat, you know, they they use language which which sometimes sounds a bit fatalistic or you know so you might say oh i've got a saturn transit today you know oh, i better not do anything fun or whatever and and Fortuno would say the same about his own planetary positions and his his own saturn that he felt made him melancholy that doesn't mean to say that actually you you view the system as deterministic so i think you have to distinguish between you know the sort of everyday language of astrology um by people who speak it and what actually um, was going on with Fuchina's understanding of the power of that symbolic system to actually liberate people from a fate-bound kind of existence. And he was very, very disparaging about his contemporary astrologers, who he called petty ogres, who he felt um, limited, shackled people to a kind of fate because they weren't able to understand that astrology is a poetic language that um, frees you from literalism. It uh, yes, uh, and I think the humanist part is, is correct. If you if you look at what his natural magic system is slash was, they're essentially doing psychotherapy. You know, six hundred years ago in Florence, it's uh, it's it's quite it's definitely a man out of time stuff. There, it's halfway to Jung uh, when he's with what he implies. But I think that's what I mean because uh, I'm going to stick with this because I don't believe him when he says because uh, Iamblichus says you can't know God without theurgy which is ritual that's essentially the kind of argument can you understand or come to know God by faith alone and Iamblichus comes down and actually no there is a you need there needs to be theurgy there needs to be a performative experiential component to it which I agree with uh, Ficino goes all the way, so so his Venusian quote unquote rituals would be surround yourself with Venusian things and and music and scents and and colors and 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 so on and essentially soak in it. Now that's four fifths of the way to invoking a pagan goddess, and other people at the time were <laughs> were taking yes. it that next step, yeah. and that's where I want to I want to know what your opinion is, Angela, yeah. as to whether or not he took that extra step into full-blown magic or oh. whether you actually believe that he kind of stayed at that level wouldn't the temptation have been there to just okay. like throw I, in an orphic think, hymn <laughs> well yes i i think i i think he was treading a very fine line and i think as you say quite rightly i think he knew i think he knew perfectly well where his magic could lead in terms of the and theurgic principles i think that i I've, I've always felt that his de veto is like kind of first steps in theurgy disguised as natural magic um but he doesn't he of course he doesn't state that explicitly and no. he's always he's always slipping around so he'll say something like you know some people think that the the marvelous energy of a star is a diamond or god other people just think it's the the power of the star you know, so he's he will never come down as you know, to, to, to a sort of definite definition of something which might get him into any kind of trouble at all. But at the same time, you sense, because you know what Iamblichus was doing, and you, you, you know, because we, we know that the ultimate aim of, of Iamblichian theology is, is, is the, to become godlike, to actually become you know, a deity. Um, you think, well, you know, is this what, what, where he feels his natural magic could actually end up? And I think he does know that, yeah. but he's not able to say it. No, and I, I th think I that's think clever of him. Out you know, of that text. that's that's very clever because it's not just you could end up with Bruno's fate, although that was you know later on, but that can still happen. Uh, it's 
also there's a, there's an element that he was uh, on a good thing, which he was. I mean, he's a brilliant man, but y- y- in his case, you can lose your job, you can get burned. There's a whole lot of bad stuff that can happen if you have, say, Bruno's lack of impulse control when dealing with yeah. very powerful and dangerous men. Absolutely. Um, and of course, in the 1490s, when um, Lorenzo de' Medici had died and various colleagues of Vicino's had also died in extraordinary circumstances, Pico de Mirandola died suddenly. Suddenly, there was, oh, well, then we had the, um, the mad friar, you know, Savonarola coming to Florence and, and railing against astrology and Platonism and the bonfires of the vanities and all this. That's when you start seeing the real fear coming. And you know, there is an extraordinary letter from Ficino to his friend, the poet Poliziano, saying, you know, I never believed in astrology. I was only translating Plotinus. Um, you know, like a kind of, it's the only statement we have really, which shows that there was something you know, happening in that time that everybody was very frightened of. Um, so I, I think it was it was a very you know, enormous black cloud that suddenly descended at that point, and even even Ficino was having to try and um, yeah get out of, of what he'd some of the things he'd said previously about astrology. Well, wow. uh, let's talk about the academy. What even was that, Angela? What the Platonic Academy? Yeah. Um, well, some people say it didn't exist as an actual organised body as such, but there certainly seems to have been a group of intellectuals around Ficino who were committed to, you know, restoring Platonism and they would celebrate Plato's birthday. Um, Ficino's translation of Plato's Symposium, I think, arose out of out of a meeting they had where they all took on a, a speech, you know, in, in, in honour of love and that kind of thing. So it was definitely a community, a male community, um, dedicated to the revival of these things. They apparently, they would sing Orphic hymns. They had their, their magical rituals. Um, yeah, a very uh, sort of little sort of power powerhouse of, of, of um, platonic philosophers with, within Florence. You mentioned male only. There are, um, there are things about Ficino that haven't aged quite so well. Well, yeah. um, uh, uh, like his rampant misogyny, mostly um, <laughs> being the main one, I think. Well, yeah, it's it's a difficult one. I mean, when I was um, it, it, I, when I did my PhD on Ficino, it was it was quite an extraordinary experience because I felt that um, I felt that I was being asked by him in some way to justify his astrology, you know, within his Platonic project because at that time there was hardly any in fact probably no scholarship at all which really understood astrology as part of 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 the the sort of enormity really of what he was doing the importance of it but scholars who didn't who weren't astrologers who didn't understand it were kind of rather embarrassed by the fact that someone like Pacino was an astrologer so I felt that I, when I became familiar with his work and I was also learning astrology and and practicing music and immersed in the renaissance and i just had this sense that he was asking me to write something that would really you know show the intellectual world or the scholarly world what he was really trying to do with astrology so i felt i had no choice but i had to do this but at the same time it was very very difficult for me because you know as a woman i felt i was being drawn into this male this male milieu you know with that the only woman that ficino ever mentions is his mother um who he he looked after in Florence apparently until she was uh, into an old age. So I was I was very much struggling with this male community who had very seemed to have very strong sort of homoerotic ties to each other, and no no mention at all you know of relationships with with women as intellectuals or you know, as as you say you know Ficino was well he was a priest so he was celibate and he wasn't interested in. In women in that kind of way at all so it was a very difficult for me and um i remember several times you know, thinking i'd throw the whole thing out of the window because i was becoming becoming a bit like um or i was feeling that i was having to become a, a kind of platonic male in order to really mm. relate to these guys it was yeah it was it's, um, i i think i think he was jealous of women um, when you say he was celibate, I go in and out on that because I'm going to obviously ask you about uh, young Giovanni. Um, 
after this, but I think uh, I think he was jealous of women because I think it's not homoerotic. I think he was full. I'm gay, so I'm gonna this is, don't in case this is weird. I think he was uh, a by the end kind of bitter closet case, uh, and I think he was jealous of them. The misogyny is surprising even for the time <laughs> when when you look at how he conceptualizes the spiritual function of women and so on it's it's alarming it, it's it's not the kind of stuff you're used to reading because you know it's 600 years ago um i'm not sure where he where he's I, i'm not sure where he speaks derogatory about spiritual capacities of women but i think he would he, you know, he'd been following probably following plato in in, in some of the, the strange things that were said there uh, there's a very telling comment. I think it's in the Three Books of Life, where he says he's talking about you know, magical spell, magical love filters, and he says something like, well, "Of course, you know, others. I don't use these. Others use these because Venus is is Diana to me. You know, in other words, he he doesn't commune at all mm. with with Venus. He only communes with 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 the moon goddess Diana, who's who's obviously um, pure and sort of celibate. But um, uh, sorry, I've, I've forgotten what the question was. Oh no, it was um, I, it was just an observation that it's. I think that Academy um, was not. I think homoerotic is too weak a term to describe at least some of them. Uh, I think. Oh yes, <laughs> I think okay. it was I'm sure. Yeah, a bit more than that. Yeah. yeah. Um, I mean, I, I mean, I have to, I have to remain loyal to Fortuna in some ways. You know, I think, I, I think his wisdom was absolutely extraordinary and. I'm sure he was very true to his ideals. It, and we also have to remember that the, 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 in the period, it was very difficult for women to... I mean, there were intellectual women. I mean, there were great artistic women like Isabella d'Este and so on. But um, it was much more difficult for women to um, to, to have that kind of um, education and, that, and, and to that kind of interest. Um, oh, there lots of his circle were married, obviously Lorenzo and people. But... Um, yeah, I mean it, it's it's difficult for us. I think that's one very difficult thing for us to to accept. I think is 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 the the gender issue. And uh, potentially the uh, age gap issue in in some of their cases. Florence, I, I was reading. Um, I think it's a. I think it's one of um, Dr. Hanegraaff's pieces that. Um, Florentine in German is uh, is still kind of admittedly archaic slang for sodomy. Now, like Florence at the time was the place for for this kind of sin, and uh, it just knowing that and and looking at the academy and and looking at some of the stuff that he wrote to like Cavalcanti, and we don't really know how old Cavalcanti was when he came to like befriend um, a mid-30s priest who said all these things about men and love and, and so on. And there are yeah. just pieces. I'm not, it's not even like a repudiation so much as it is a complexification of what's going on. Oh, I agree. And I think in a way it's quite sad, that, you know, when you read about um, Ficino's kind of attachment to, to Cavalcanti and why he wrote the, um, the, his, his um, translation of, of, Ficino, of Plato's Symposium dedicated to Cavalcanti and yeah, you get the sense of an older man who who would really love to have a sort of warm, loving relationship with someone and somehow can't and has dedicated himself to priesthood anyway and is sort of longing for something. And yeah, I think it's 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 quite sad in many ways that um he wasn't able to do that. On the other hand, I think he he devoted himself to a different task, which was this enormous task of bringing something to the West, bringing something new to the West. And the amount that he wrote and the amount that he translated is, is staggering, really. And he probably wouldn't have been able to do that if he wasn't living a solitary life. That's very true. And that the impact is astounding. I mean, he's he was corresponding with... Uh, you know, powerful people and, and artists and philosophers all over Europe. He was he was a hub of the Renaissance. He wasn't just a participant. That's right. Yeah, absolute, absolutely. And um, and then his work, you know, came over into England in the early 16th century and um, directly influenced, of course, the Hermetic revival of the Elizabethan age. So. Yeah, and and as you said earlier, you know, he can be very much seen in, as a kind of uh, participant in a whole line of thinkers who are concerned with the same issues and the same ideas in very different ways. 
Um, of course, he, Ficino himself would have understood this as part of what he would call the ancient theology, that he was continuing the work of the ancient theology that started with Hermes and Zoroaster and came up through Plato, the Neoplatonists, and then to himself. And we can perhaps extend that on and, you know, and see various people like Jung, as you've mentioned, you know, who are trying to, it, it's about bringing the opposites together, you know, and Ficino stated quite, quite clearly that he was working with trying to bring together philosophy and religion. So that takes us back to McGilchrist again, you know, that we're, these are people who are trying to work to bring together in, in harmonious relationship these two powerful ways of human knowing. You know, reason, revelation is another way of putting it. And we find Jung, you know, trying to do the same thing. Um, and I think we find, you know, but maybe um, 19th, 20th century theosophy was also a project to try and do the same thing. The New Age movement in its various forms is trying to do the same thing. Um, and I think now, you know, we're moving towards a whole kind of movement, which may be called something like consciousness studies or something that's trying to move towards understanding the, the nature of human consciousness in a much bigger context and trying to bring science into it, which is also trying to do the same thing. So I think it's there's, there's these little sort of beacons, as, as you were saying, you know, that that light up this possibility for us that we can we can become whole. You know, we can actually get these two ways of knowing working well together. Um, and that is an ongoing human work. You know, and it, and it all, it's always going to meet resistance as well. Yeah. It is. I think that's. I think that's just built into reality, and it's. It's kind of a, a point in the column for uh for being unofficially or officially gnostic. Yeah. So I mean, just talking about being gnostic, you know, we we absolutely love the work of Jeffrey Kripal. I don't know whether you've you've come across. Oh, and he's him. been on the show a couple of times. I love. I love oh, Dr. Yeah, Jeff. Yeah. Well, yeah. Yes. So so you know he he's an absolutely great guy at, 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 at doing exactly this, and and um. So I, I um, direct a program here at Canterbury, which is an MA program called Myth, Cosmology and the Sacred. And we very much base ourselves around um, what Jeff talks about as the third classroom, you know, or the Gnostic classroom, the place where um, studying this sort of powerful material, one goes beyond what he calls a classroom of faith and classroom of reason to this third place where you're, where you're trying to look back at, at both these, these positions and reach a third, sort of higher, deeper um, place, uh, however you would call it, which he calls the Gnostic classroom. I think this is where we have to we have to go now, particularly you know, in education. No, yeah, absolutely. Uh, the just to circle back around to almost where we began, uh, Ficino and music. How did uh, I mean, How did he see music, and how did it fit into this this philosophy and in this attempted kind of marriage of religion and philosophy that you were talking about how did it fit for him well i think he saw music as the most powerful image of um divine harmony in order so this would be coming from the pythagorean um understanding of the power of harmonious number and this, so this goes back to plato's timaeus where um plato talks of the harmonious musical intervals of the fourth the fifth and the octave being woven into the sort of fabric of the world's soul. And therefore, they're also woven into the fabric of the human soul, but the human soul is all kind of muddled and chaotic and upside down and needs to straighten itself out and, and remember these perfect harmonies. So the playing of music, which has perfect harmonies in it, which is very harmonious, can then sort of help the human soul remind itself of, of its divine origins. That's the platonic idea of music. So that would be why it was so important for Ficino to use music as part of his project, of his therapeutic project of, of straightening out the soul, if you like, in, as part of his natural magic. So the combination of, of musical sound, which connects you straight back to the, the harmonies of the cosmos, as he would see it, and images, um, and timing as an astrologer. So it became part of, a, of this very, very intricate um, way of, of, of of composing a kind of ritual or working with people to do with their own horoscope, the timing of, of, of planetary movements in relation to their own horoscope, um, the kind of music that might um, reflect qualities of their own horoscope um, or their character or their personality as well, all became part of a, a kind of project of helping people realign themselves. 
it's it's astounding to me because that's what that's like experimental depth psychology in uh in the 1400s it's it, it doesn't it is. it's it's so far ahead you, you could uh yes. you could see a psychotherapist for that now it's amazing it is absolutely amazing what he was doing. I mean, well, this is this is of course a, a movement I haven't mentioned is you know transpersonal psychology. So people like it's Hillman and um, Thomas More, you know, the, the kind of work that transpersonal psychology is doing comes straight from Ficino. I mean, that that is quite extraordinary. Um, and of course, in Ficino's time, he, there was also a, um, a whole um, sort of expansion of the of ideas of music theory um, associating particular musical modes with particular planets so a whole musical language was being created that 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 he could use to to do this evocation um very 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 creative time and that uh that particular um astrological music or blend is one of the things that cast very long shadows over the next you know uh, arguably still today but um the the use of the astrological implications of magic stuck around in european music in in some cases for a while and that all kind of ties back to ficino well i think so i mean um, there must have been people doing using music in magical rituals before then of course and yeah. you've really got to think <laughs> of the power of music in the church i mean yeah. you know music has always been recognized as as being a very unmediated kind of image you know i think the three, Ficino himself says, I mean, obviously following Plato, you know, that through the ears, the soul immediately receives, you know, indications of harmony in, in a way that's much quicker and more immediate than through the eyes. So uh, you know, music has just always been used, hasn't it, to induce kind of altered states and, and, and to remind people of things. But in this very, very deliberate way that's very psychological, very therapeutic, um, I, don't, I don't know of anyone that was doing it before Ficino. But of course, we have got the whole Arabic the whole Arabic um, Islamic school of of magic and medicine and philosophy that was flourishing um, in the early medieval period, where all sorts of extraordinary things were happening, um, all sorts of therapeutic uses of music and magic. So in some ways, he was picking up on that as well. So I think it's been pretty, yeah. Yeah, um, yeah. the Picatrix was known at the time. So yeah. um, there were a couple of texts like that in the Chironides, which I think was called Aristotle at the time. But there, so there are a few of the ones that, um, he would have had kind of reference for, I guess, is the, is the right word, when he was doing his translation and, and synthesis project, because there's indications in either of them that you can do this. Yes, and particularly in, in the Timaeus, of course, I think that would have been a, a quite an inspirational text for him in terms of the, the theory of, of why the music was so important. Um but I think you know, Ficino was a very hands-on person. He he wasn't content just to read about these ideas. He wanted to actually affect people here and now with the power of them. So that is what I think marks him out in some ways you know, from just being a translator or just being a philosopher is the practice element you know, that, that it was no good just translating these things. He wanted to actually change people's lives with them. Uh do you know where he was buried? No, I don't. No. Oh yes. Uh, no, no, I don't know where he was buried, but he's he's got a he's he's got a um um a memorial bust in the cathedral in Florence. Yes, I went to see that one, but I it wasn't clear to me when I was yeah. there if that's where he was buried. I, it's. I'm sure one could find out, but I I can't I can't think of it offhand exactly where he was buried. Right. Uh. So for people who. I think everyone who listens to the show more or less would be aware of Massilio Ficino and, and certainly uh, the uh, you know a- arrival of Hermetic texts into or re- return of Hermetic texts into Europe. But specifically, uh, texts written by Ficino. Do you have? I know you've done a PhD, so this is kind of like an unfair thing to ask. But do you have a do you have a favorite? And is that different to the one you would recommend to people to read first? Well, my favourite just has to be the De Vita. It has to be the, the, the third part of his three books on life, you know, How to Fit Your Life to the Heavens, um, of which there's a, a scholarly translation by um, Casca and Clark. Um, and I've, most of it is in my little book on Marsilia Ficino, the Western Esoteric Masters series. Uh, and I just love it because of its, its combination of music and magic and astrology and platonic and neoplatonic philosophy and the humanness of it, you know, because, you know, it's somebody trying to 
give something to the world that people can do and practice and make their lives better. So it's not a great heavy treatise. It's, it's something that's very readable. Um, and obviously, because I have been a musician and I'm an astrologer and, and, and I try to try to sort of practice these things in my own kind of way, um, I absolutely love it. And when I point, when I recommend it to my students, they all love it too. And I, th I think I would, if you want to start with Vicino, I would say that or also his letters. So he wrote vast amounts of letters. I mean, probably thousands of letters which most of which are now being translated or have been translated by the School of Economic Science. Um, and they are such a wonderful glimpse as well into his, into his humanness, into his generosity, his friendliness, you know, sort of chatting with his friends. Sometimes they're quite chatty, sometimes they're quite formal. To all the uh, famous people of his time, Lorenzo and Pico and Popes and so on. Um, but they're always with a very, with a, with a sort of aim to, to kind of ennoble the individual and to recognise their strengths and to help them develop their their strengths and their talents. And this great sense of the letters are both personal, but also contain a kind of universal wisdom. And I actually started by reading his letters. Um, so again, I would, I would say that they are very, very accessible and um, a good starting point. Ah, I, I didn't realize that. I also was unaware that there was that you guys share music and astrology, because um, I I have your book. I've I've read it uh, multiple times. And do you th is his personality present as much as it is in the text you've selected for that book, or is it uh, or is that kind of one of the subtextual? goals of of assembling these particular pieces because is he there on every page whatever i read or because i he's in that book like you actually get his personality with the with the text you've selected and uh, i find that very interesting is that how he always wrote or was that one of your goals with the book uh well my goal with the book was to gather text specifically on astrology um and some of them are letters so they are of a more maybe more personal um, tone maybe you don't get quite the same feeling if you read his platonic theology you know which is much more of a kind of weighty weighty kind of um kind of proof really of the compatibility of christianity and platonism but whatever you read there's always this sense of of poetry and metaphor and he says that one i think it's in one of his introductions introduction to to plato he says i just love plato's style because it is so poetic because it's so metaphoric it leads you on these wonderful imaginative kind of flights and that's how I want to write he says and that, that's what I want to do and he does you won't find any of his texts uh, being dry or theoretical because his aim was always to use imagery um, to imagery and metaphor to to help people um, to help people enter into this this journey of, of, of getting past the literal mind wonderful well Angela, this has been fantastic. Uh, I, I I love talking about this stuff. Uh, it's yeah, it's been amazing. So I just want to say thank you very much for your time and thank you for your book. As I said, I've I've had it for a while and I've uh, I always find myself going back to it. Oh, thank you very much. I'm, not, I'm kind of moving on to other things now, but um, Fortuna will always remain a kind of um, a guiding spirit for me. But it's been great talking to you. Piccino, Platonism, Theurgy, Astrology, Talismanic Magic, all the hits. I do just want to shine a light on the MA course that Dr. Voss runs, particularly but not exclusively for UK-based listeners who might be interested. There aren't all that many of them around, so even if you're idly thinking of moving from this is my jam to professionalizing my jam, then check out the show notes for more course information and some contact details to boot. Also, be sure to check out the open lecture series if you are in the area. Uh, other things to check out include runesoup.com and the Runesoup Facebook page and a little-known, somewhat underground website, if you will, called Twitter, where you will find me at Gordon, G-O-R-D-O-N, underscore white, W-H-I-T-E. Until next time. <laughs>